1941. The Atlantic seaboard of the United States. To Americans, the war in Europe is a distant menace, too far away to touch their shores. Or so they think. The arm of war is about to extend its reach. From below these waters, an army is coming. Soon the United States will suffer its worst defeat at sea, and most Americans will never know about it. December 1941. Five German U-boats set out on a secret mission, codenamed Operation Drumbeat. The boats depart from German-occupied France, heading across the Atlantic to take up positions along the North American coast. Once in place, they will attack merchant shipping, carrying cargo vital to the Allied war effort. Leading the assault will be U-boat 123. Its destination, New York Harbor. Commanding the boat is 28-year-old Reinhard Hartigan. The lieutenant commander's audacity is already legendary among the U-boat fleet. I was very proud to go to New York to be one of the first submarines. Uh, it was war and I was a soldier of the German Navy and so uh, it was a very uh, big thing for me. You see. But first, they must cross 3,000 miles of bitter seas. U-boats were designed for destruction, not comfort. Loaded with 15 torpedoes and 180 rounds of heavy artillery, the boats leave little room for their crews. Food is squeezed into every available space. But soon the fresh bread and meat will begin to rot. With no heaters, the boat's inside temperature matches that of the cold Atlantic, and a continual moist fog permeates every compartment. The bunks, each assigned one set of sheets for the entire trip, sleep several men in rotating shifts. But the hardship is overshadowed by the constant danger of detection. Watchmen above keep an eye on the horizon. Radio messages are encrypted in one of the most complex codes ever devised, one the Germans are confident the enemy will never decipher. But they are wrong. British intelligence has broken the code and is tracking Operation Drumbeat westward. They pass on the information to Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Navy, Admiral Ernest J. King. But King fails to respond. Admiral King was an Anglophobe, did not like the British, detested the Royal Navy, and would not heed the intelligence that that Navy sent him. This is one of the most remarkable things about Drumbeat, in that the entire operation was known to the Americans, the almost exact courses and positions of the U-boats were transmitted by London to Washington day by day, and yet Admiral King and his subordinate commanders did nothing about it. Admiral King underestimated the U-boat. He thought of it still as a ship that was ancillary to the fleet, instead of being, as the Germans used it, an independently operating weapons platform with immense destructive power. Drumbeat is supposed to begin on January 13th with simultaneous attacks by all five U-boats. But one day ahead of schedule, just east of Cape Cod, Hartigan sights an opportunity too good to pass up. Operation Drumbeat begins early.
A British steamer is 123's first victim. 100 men perish. January 14th, off Long Island, New York. 123 torpedoes its second ship. The Norwegian tanker sends out an SOS. But only 123 hears it. Hardigan moves boldly closer to the shore. Traveling on the surface, he follows the lights of Long Island. Unlike Europe, the U.S. has yet to practice blackout procedures, allowing Hardigan to search for targets against a well-lit shoreline. Hardigan creeps toward New York Harbor. His mission has been devised in such haste that he lacks adequate charts and must rely on tourist maps. Near midnight, Hardigan brings 123 to a stop and calls his men to the bridge to behold the very symbol of American confidence and might, New York City. It was fascinating. We had never dreamed of seeing New York. The whole atmosphere, the lights, the size. We had been at sea for such a long time and only seen water. To suddenly see this splendor, it was fascinating. With a Navy nowhere in sight, U-123 travels south on the surface in broad daylight. Off the coast of North Carolina, snapshots record what begins to resemble a turkey shoot. I remember one night when we sank two tankers within a very short time. I think it was around about one hour only. When I uh, saw a lot of ships, I looked for the biggest one, the shore. And when I saw a, a small uh, uh, three or four thousand tons, and I saw some lights and I uh, let them go, maybe that is a bigger one. And this was no special danger, for no special risk. We had no uh, anti-air, anti-submarine uh, against us. So it was no, no special events for us to sink these ships, these poor ships, they ran into our torpedoes. January 19th, U-123's bloodiest night. The waters off of Cape Hatteras fill with bodies and wrecked hulls. America grows alarmed at the testimony of survivors. Survivors. 42 seamen, the entire crew of the Norwegian tanker Varanga, are safe in a New Jersey port. Hitler's U-boat strike desperately, sinking six ships in one week. Hardest hit was the steamship city of Atlanta. These two seamen were wounded. 46 shipmates lost their lives. The United States Navy announces that some U-boats were sunk and emphasizes the importance of secrecy about counterblows. When we were struck with the torpedo, we were going south. When uh, I was suddenly awakened. It sounded like somebody had uh, fired a pistol off close to my ear. And I looked out uh, toward the water. The side of the ship that we were on was leaning from starboard to port. And when I stepped off the boat deck, I stepped right into the water. The ship had heeled over that far. Then we started uh, gathering around a skylight that was blown off the engine room. There was a coal passer. He was a black man, old. He was in his, probably in his um, early 60s. And he was uh, on this, uh, this skylight. And he was kneeling down and, and he was praying. He didn't have a stitch of clothes on at all. And it was cold out there. Kneeling down and praying. And I watched him and he finished his prayer and rolled over into the water. I never did see him again. Of the 44 men who get off the ship alive, 
41 die in the frigid waters. But I never went back to sea after that. I never had any desire to go back after that. Da hat man noch nichts dabei gedacht. We didn't think about it. We were young, 18 years old, and didn't understand the seriousness of it. Noch gar nicht abfasst. Es war etwas wie Freude. There was even a little joy each time we sank another ship. At that age, we didn't reflect on the consequences for the crew and their families. I think for a man going at sea, it's always terrible to see a ship sinking. Never the mind if it is uh, by intention to sink the ship or it's, it's by accident or so. But on the other hand, it was our job, to, it was our duty to sink ships. Hartigan has used all his torpedoes. Undeterred, he resorts to a daring maneuver to sink yet another freighter. Surfacing only 200 yards from his target, Hartigan orders his men to the deck gun. Sinking ships with artillery alone becomes a Hartigan trademark. And still the Navy fails to launch a counterattack. It continues to concentrate resources on guarding transatlantic convoys, leaving freighters and tankers plying the American coast unprotected. Calls to change policy fail to persuade Admiral King. Ernest G. King, maybe he was a friend of mine, I don't know, because he did nothing. He had 25 destroyers in the harbor and the Latins in the harbor. He made no blackout, n neither a dimming. And so all the, the whole coast was full of lights, the hotels and the motor cars, and I can, could see the, the ships silhouetted against the uh, uh, lightened coast, and all the ships were with full lights, and all the lighthouses and light ships had full light. And so it was uh, very easy for me, and I don't know till yet why Admiral Ernest King did nothing. That was astonishing for me. Captain Lieutenant Harding, dessen boat unmittelbar vor den Toren New Yorks operierte. On February 9th, 1942, the crew of U-123 returns to a hero's welcome at Lorient, France. Flags marking their nine kills string the periscope tower. For his work, Hartigan receives the Knight's Cross. The German high command, emboldened by stories of unprotected ships, dispatches more U-boats to American waters. Within weeks, Hartigan will join them. But this time, things will be different. 1942. 123 is back in American waters. Six more ships go down. The Navy organizes a campaign of confident reassurance. The United States Navy, the floating ports of America's first line of defense. From Nome to Norfolk, from Guam to Guantanamo, wherever our flag waves over water, there our fighting fleet is prepared to go. Interestingly, the Navy confused and obfuscated and even lied to the American people about this carnage. On April 1, fittingly April Fool's Day, 1942, the U.S. Navy announced that 28 U-boats had been sunk or presumably sunk. But as of that date, not a single U-boat had been sunk in the Atlantic 
from Maine to Florida. April 10th. Believing coastal waters to be safe, thousands of Americans crowd the beaches. But tonight, in Jacksonville, Florida, they will become witnesses to war. Well, I was 14 years old, and I lived at Ponte Vedra Beach. And it was around 9 o'clock, between 9 and 10. And I heard an explosion. We were just on the boardwalk doing things. We got on the merry-go-round. And as I was circling around, coming back so that I was facing the ocean on one of the turns, I saw this enormous orange flame out on the ocean. I thought, well, there's been some sort of accident or something. The, the war never entered my mind. Laden with fuel oil, the tanker Gulf America ignites the sky. I uh, torpedoed the Gulf America off the shore of Jacksonville Beach. She was burning but uh, was not uh, uh, sunk, and so I uh, want to shell her. But uh, I, I was, uh, the Gulf of America was between my boat and the coast, and so I didn't want to shell her in this way, because if I missed the ship, maybe uh, one shell would hit innocent people uh, ashore. Hardigan swings 123 between the shore and the ship to finish her off with artillery. As we watched, the submarine was between the tanker and the beach so that we could see an outline of the bow of the sub and where the gun was when it fired particularly. So it was a very dramatic thing. The war was so far away. It wasn't as if we were even involved in it until that happened and you actually saw that submarine. And it was so close. It was, it, you, you, it was just unbelievable to think that someone had that much, I mean, that they had that much nerve to come so close to us. In the early morning, 123 moves off, cruising confidently on the surface. But the Navy stirs. Spotter planes search the area. This time, Hardigan's fortunes change. The USS Dahlgren, on routine patrol, stumbles across his path. We saw a destroyer, and we tried to get off to deeper water where we could better dive. But the destroyer followed us, and we must dive on a very uh, shallow water. I think it was about 25 meters. As soon as the alert was given, everyone went into action. We each had a job to do. We didn't really understand the danger we faced because we were too busy getting the sub underwater. Then, finally, we heard the screws of the destroyer. Depth charge blast crippled the ship. The engines were out. We couldn't move. We were on the ground. Water had come into the boat. It is a strange feeling. Fixed on a point and knowing the enemy is over you and had the possibility to kill you, and you cannot do anything but wait. Hardigan believes the U boat is beyond repair, that the crew's only option is to flood the ship and swim 70 feet to the surface. As commander, he must open the hatch and be the first to exit. 
I opened the hatch cover, then at first uh, water came in my neck, and then I heard the destroyer came and I said, oh, let me wait uh, a moment, uh, because if I would come out and he would uh, bomb me with depth charges, I would be dead at once. Inexplicably, the destroyer moves off. The reprieve allows the crew to make repairs, and 123 limps to deeper water. I was lucky. You, you need luck. You must have a good boat and a good crew. If one man was only about 10 seconds late with what he had to do, maybe the whole boat will be lost. And so they all knew what they had to do, and they had to do it in the same moment at once. Though badly damaged and running on only one engine, U-123 isn't through yet. Hardigan has one torpedo left. His target, the SS Leslie, on its way from Cuba to New York with 3,300 tons of sugar. I heard this loud explosion. I thought that it was the, uh, the fireman had let the water levels go too low in the boilers and he'd blown the gauge glasses, which go off with one hell of a bang, I tell you. And uh, when I saw the sugar and the uh, water start to blow out the shaft alley door, I figured it wasn't the gauge glasses. I knew we'd been hit. Hardigan sinks the Leslie with the last torpedo of his career. Before changing course for France, he once more turns to his deck gun, sending two more ships under. His total of 19 kills adds to the devastation being wrought by many other U-boats, now prowling the North American coast. In all, German U-boats operating from Canada to Panama sink nearly 400 ships in the first six months of 1942. It was the greatest maritime massacre in modern history. It was the greatest defeat at sea ever suffered by the American nation. And it was a far greater disaster than was Pearl Harbor, both in terms of ships sunk and lives lost. Thousands are dying. Oil and other cargo desperately needed by the Allied forces are being lost to the sea. When the sinkings reach one a day, the Navy is finally forced to act. It adopts proven anti-sub methods, mandating convoys along the coast. The Navy also intensifies ship and air patrols from Maine to Florida. With advancements in anti-submarine weaponry, the tables turn violently. Once been the most dangerous waters in the world for merchant shipping, become perilous for U-boats. Soon no U-boat moves unopposed. Few survive. By the end of World War II, 754 U-boats have been lost worldwide. Of the nearly 40,000 men who served on U-boats, 28,000 never returned from the sea. The highest casualty rate suffered by any branch of the German military. Today, their makeshift coffins litter the ocean floor. There they rest alongside the hulks of the thousands of ships they once so freely stalked.